leads us into the start of a new series entitled, What's Your Story? And the title of the first message in this series is, We All Have a Story. We all love a good story, don't we? How many of you like to read a good book? Uh, you love it when somebody tells you a good story, or you hear about a good story, something that somebody passes along to you, or... How about a movie that you went to that was just an awesome story that was powerful and impacting? In fact, some of the movies that we go watch tell such good stories that when you hear one line from that movie, even though many years have gone by, you can remember the entire story. That's how much of an impression and how impactful that story's been. I'm, I'm going to test... Uh, I'm going to test your memory on some of these things today. I've got a little test for you. Take out your notes, if you would. I'm going to say a line from a movie, and I'm going to see if you can remember which movie it's from. Now, I'm going to ask that you refrain from shouting out the answer. Now, this is really hard for some of you. I found this out first service. Please don't answer right the name of the movie down. Let's see how well everybody does as we go through this, okay? Here we go. First line that I have for you. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. Don't say it. You can't handle the truth. I'll be back. <laughs> if you build it, he will come. Here's looking at you, kid. Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> May the force be with you. <laughs> if you can't get that one, you're in big trouble. <laughs> and lastly, you're going to need a bigger boat. All right, you guys ready? Number one was from Wizard of Oz. Number two, A Few Good Men. Number three, Terminator. Number four, Field of Dreams. Number five, Casablanca. Number six, Dirty Harry, Sudden Impact. Number seven, Star Wars. And lastly, Jaws. How many of you got all of those? You got all of them. Oh, my goodness. Check it out. We all remember these lines because good stories leave lasting impressions. Think about some of the most impacting and motivating things in your life. I would say at the top of the list is someone's story. Stories motivate us. Stories challenge us. They move us. They change us. They inspire us. I want to share with you a story that illustrates this point so well. About 15 years ago or so, I had gone to what is called a district council, which is a, a meeting where all of the ministers and leaders come together from our district. And there's literally hundreds if not a couple thousand people that gather for these few days together. Uh, we do the business of our district, we have services, we celebrate, we do all kinds of things together. But in these series of meetings, um, they were constantly, our leadership is coming to us and they take offerings to cover the costs of the district council, which is, which is, it costs quite a bit to do. 
And they will come to us, express to us how much they need to cover the expenses. They take an offering, and then they'll come back again, and they'll say, you know, we're still not there. Can you help us? And they'll repeat this several times, and, and generally, they don't cover all of the costs. They're always falling well short. Well, it was in one of these meetings that there was a special prayer request that came to us during one of our sessions, and a gentleman came up, and he said to us before the entire general council, he said, um, I need to share with you guys, there is one of our fellow pastors and his family, they've been trying to get here, uh, but their car is broke down, and they've been unable to make it, and he went on to say uh, that this pastor is what we call a home missions pastor. The church is too small to pay his salary. He works a full-time job, and he's just he was so excited about coming to district council that he had raised some money to bring his whole family down to be a part of this, and now they're broke down on the side of the road. So this gentleman was expressing this, and he was asking us to pray when somebody had responded, yeah, I think we need to pray, but why don't we take an offering for him so he can get his car fixed? So we pause the entire council, we take an offering, we take enough of an offering, about $20,000 came in to buy him a brand new car. We had a dealer that was in the audience with us, he went back, they picked a car for this family, got it at cost so he got a much better car than he could have and when this minister arrived and walked in with his family, he walked down and we handed him the keys to a brand new car. How awesome is that? Now what was the difference between the offerings? The difference was, one was attached to a real human story, something that somebody was facing, and people were moved and motivated by that story and wanted to give and be a part of a miracle for this man and his family. Folks, every person in this room has a story to tell. The enemy knows that the most powerful tool in a believer's hand is their own personal story of salvation. It's their own testimony. Nothing can impact lives for the kingdom and win people to Jesus more than your personal stories. Statistics show us this to be true. There was a survey taken by Institute for the American Church Growth, they asked over 10,000 people this question. What was responsible for your coming to church? And this is how they replied. Let's go down through the answers, right in the percentages. I had a special need, so that means that was the reason I showed up and got connected to this church. That was 2%. I just walked in, 3%. I like the pastor. Boy, this is just going to be astronomical. I like the pastor. Oh, you guys, they're all up there already. Oh, cool. Well, 6%. I visited there, 1%. I like the classes they promote, 1%. I like the programs, 3%. A person I have a relationship with invited me. Look at the number, 79%. A friend, a relative, a person that I trust, whose story I believe, whose life has impacted mine. They are the reason I have come, and they are the reason I have found faith. I love Pastor Gene's quote, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. We have to get personally involved, relationally with people, and share our stories with them. Our life and our story is the most powerful tool God has placed in our hands to impact the lives of others around us. We all have a story to tell. And that brings me to the passage. The Bible confirms this to be true. And we're going to stay with this passage this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would. Revelation chapter 12. And we're just going to look at verse 11. And here's what it says. They have conquered him. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their what? 
They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We're going to spend some time in this verse. Many of us have never realized how truly powerful our story is when it's put in the hands of God. It is usually one of two reasons we don't share our story. We don't share our testimony. The first reason could be you grew up in church all your life. You're a church baby, a church kid. You grew up around the church. You didn't ever depart from the church. And, and so you would say to yourself, well, I don't have much to say. I've been in church all my life. I didn't run out and do a bunch of bad things. So what do I have to share? That's the one extreme where the enemy tells you there's no value you and you sharing and the other extreme is man you were out in the world you did everything there was to do you had things happen to you that were unspeakable and now that you're saved there are some that are ashamed about those things and the enemy tells you don't say it don't put it out there don't speak it and in either case you need to understand the enemy is trying to tell us our stories aren't important well, I'm here to tell you your personal story is the most powerful soul winning tool that you have in your hands. Your story is the key to setting others free and the enemy will do whatever he can, listen to me, to minimize your testimony. Yep. Let's break the verse down. Revelation 12, 11. Let's take the first half. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. The question is, who are we conquering? Who are we conquering? Put it in. We're conquering the devil. We're conquering the enemy. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. How many of you know we are in spiritual warfare? Do you believe there is a very real war for the souls of humanity? Do you believe that's true? You believe we're in the midst of warfare and the enemy is, 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 is in a very real battle with, with trying to drag people to hell with him. There is a very real battle with very high stakes. How many of you know eternity weighs in the balance? The devil has been given much power on this earth. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.2, 2, I'm going to read from two different versions, but there's lots of passages. We don't have time, but look at Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you once walked, now it's speaking about you before you became a believer, in which you once walked, following the chorus of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of of disobedience. Let me read it from the NLT. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. The Bible indicates the devil, he is at work, it calls him the prince of the power of the air. Do you know why the devil is called a prince? You know why he's the prince? Because there's only one king, baby, and he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and his name is Jesus. But the enemy has been given power, power to rule and reign in this world, power to influence, power to cause destruction. The devil has a structure with rulers and authorities. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Also, the devil has power and authority over the current world system. He is very much at work in this world. The spirit of the enemy is very much alive in this world. He is accomplishing his intended purpose. But here is what I want you to know. There is only one group of people who have escaped from his dominion. And that group is every born again believer who has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has no power over you. 
Isn't that good news? How have we conquered him? We have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. Write that down, by the blood of the lamb. Now look at Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, we've been bought back, the forgiveness of sins. Look at Acts chapter 26, verse 18. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will re uh, receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. How many of you know that he has delivered us through the power of the blood upon the cross? Now, we have an Old Testament example of this, one of which was when the children of Israel were being delivered from Egypt do you remember the final plague upon Pharaoh's land? The final plague was the death angel was going to come and take the firstborn of every household. But God gave instruction to his people. He said, go out, take a lamb, kill that lamb, and take the blood. And every household, take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorpost on the left. Put it on the doorpost on the right and put it across the threshold, across the top beam. And then when you walk inside, when the death angel passes by, the blood will protect you from all harm. You will not be affected by the, by the, by the death angel that comes through the camp. How many of you know today this promise is still very true for every one of us? Jesus is the door, and we walk through the door by the blood of the Lamb. We are covered in His name. And so from doorpost to threshold, all the way down, the devil cannot come through. And listen to me, because we've been bought by the blood of Jesus, the devil cannot touch us. This. Can't touch it. Can't touch this. He has power and dominion over the world, its systems, and every other area that God has allowed within those limits. Of course, God is in control, but he's allowed him within limits, but he has no power or authority over any believer who's been bought by the blood of the Lamb. You guys remember Superman's one weakness? Kryptonite. kryptonite. When Superman would come around kryptonite, he would lose his power. I want you to know today, you are the devil's kryptonite. He has no power, no authority. When he comes around you, he shrieks back. When you stand your ground, the devil knows. When a born-again, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled believer shows up on the scene, there is nothing he can do to stop them. But this is just the first part of Revelation chapter 12. There is a second part. Look at it with me again. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, you see that word and, there's the conjunction, and, 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 the word of their what? Testimony. The devil knows there's two parts to the promise. He knows for every born-again believer who knows Jesus is their Savior, they are protected. He cannot snatch them from the Father's hand. He knows this. He knows that you're born again, you're set free, but there is a second part to that passage that he knows, and here is the deal. The devil wants this to be his goal. If he can't touch you, he doesn't want you to take anybody to heaven with you. So he wants you to sit on your testimony. Yeah, you're saved and you're going to heaven and maybe there's nothing he can do about it, but he certainly doesn't want you to take a massive crowd with you to the other side. He's hoping you just kind of sit around and wait till Jesus comes back someday. But what does the Bible say? 
you conquer him, you overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony is, write it down, your story. I love the biblical definition of the word testimony. The word testimony comes in three parts, and I think this is key. Three things, and that is witness, evidence, and reputation. See, there are a lot of things that people can argue with us about when it comes to faith and it comes to religion. If you go to share with somebody, right, and you're talking about Christianity, listen, they can come back at you and say, what about other religions? Or how can you prove to me the Bible is reliable? How do you know? How do you know it's not just a book of fables? Or they may come back and say, hasn't science proved the Bible wrong? They can argue all these things. Even in cults, they can argue doctrine with you. Trust me, I know. I've talked to Mormons. I've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses. And we call it Bible ping pong. I hit a verse to them, and they hit a verse back to me. And then I put one back over to them, and it's back and forth. And we really get nowhere as we go back and forth arguing scripture but there is one area they can never argue with me on when I put all of that on pause and I simply step forward and say can I share my story with you on what it means for me to be born again and have a personal relationship with my heavenly father can I tell you about the prayers that he's answered can I tell you about how the Holy Spirit speaks to me let me tell you about the miracles that I've seen they just look at me with a, a glazed look in their eyes because at that point there is no argument how can you argue with my testimony you see the devil knows how powerful your testimony is and that's why he wants to get you to minimize that testimony and there are three parts to the testimony that are important so write them in and let's go over them first is right it's witness Three parts, witness the things I share. See, if there was ever an area the enemy tries to defeat God's people in, it's in the area of you sharing your story. The enemy lies to us and tells us our story isn't worth telling. <laughs> our story isn't worth telling. Are you kidding me? You've been redeemed, you've been set free. You've been forgiven. You've been given a brand new life. I don't care if you grew up in church or you got saved yesterday. You've got something to say about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who have set you free. Not only that, but when he's come into your life, how many of you know that he set you on fire and they can see the passion in your eyes that something is different about you? You see, the Apostle Paul never shied away from sharing the power of his testimony. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 31, I encourage you to go read it. It's the entire story of his salvation experience. In Acts chapter 22, verse 6 through 13, he goes back and he retells his conversion story. He never shied away from the compelling story he had. He often talked about life before Christ, and then he talked about what it was like to be born again. And even though all of our personal stories may be different, they have the same components, and it's simply this, before I knew Jesus, and now that I know Jesus. And when you put it into those two categories, you can share about what God has done in your life. Not only that, you now have the answer to life's greatest questions. The three greatest questions every person wants to know is this. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? Guess what you have the answer to? Oh, I know who I am. I'm a son of the Most High God, not because of what I've done. He adopted me into his family. You know, when nobody wanted me, I got adopted in. I wasn't good enough. I didn't earn it. But my loving father sent his brother to die in my place so that he could adopt me into his family. So I'm a son of God. You know why I'm here? I'm here to glorify him and live for him and do whatever I can to promote his kingdom. And do you know where I'm going? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. If I were to die today, I will be be in heaven when I breathe my last breath. I know who I am. 
why I'm here and where I'm going. You don't think people want to know an answer to that? You see, that's why scripture says in Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. I'm so sick of bad news. Anybody sick of bad news? Anybody sick of fake news? Anybody just sick of the news altogether? I'm here to tell you, I've got good news to bring. I want to be the bearer of the greatest message that's ever been brought to the world, and his name is Jesus. So number one, number one, you've got to share your story. You've got to witness. Number two, the second part, of conquering him by the word of our testimony is, here it is, write it in evidence. You want evidence? The second weapon that destroys the work of the enemy is evidence of a transformed life. There is nothing the enemy can do to stop the powerful, the powerful impact of a life that's been transformed. Some of you, you got saved, maybe you're still working at the same job, and, and, and you were one person, whatever that meant, and then when you got saved, they watched before their very eyes, the old you went away, and the new you emerged, and they're all blown away by what happened to your life. Anybody have that happen in their life? That's the power, the power of your transformation. You're being transformed right before their very eyes. And listen, it's undeniable and nobody can argue with it. You guys remember the, remember the show uh, some years ago? It's real popular called The Biggest Loser. Remember that show? And they would bring people on and, right, they all went through this radical tra body transformation of weight loss. And some of these individuals... Pretty dramatic weight loss has gone on. Uh, these are some of the winners of the show. And look, it, how many of you know, that's undeniable. If, if you knew, go back to that other one. If, if you knew this guy, and then this guy shows up, how many of you know, that's pretty undeniable evidence that something's changed. Well, I'm here to tell you, Spiritually, it's the exact same evidence. When our lives are transformed, it is undeniable for all that see. And I'm here to tell you, we're not the biggest losers. We're the biggest winners. Come on now. Somebody's excited in the back. The Apostle Paul often wrote about transformation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. <clears throat> this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. The, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul said, when God found me, see, he didn't mind sharing it. He said, I was the worst of sinners, man. He didn't mind telling people. And listen to what he says. 1 Timothy 1. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. No one can argue with a life that has been transformed. You know what's so awesome for me as a pastor? 30 years I've been involved in ministry. Started when I was five and a half years old, but <laughs> 30 years I've been in the ministry. And you know what is awesome to watch is when people come in and their lives are falling apart, man. They, they, they come to this hospital, and man, they have just made a mess 
of their life and they don't know what else to do, where else to turn. They've got one thing they're going to try that's left. Somebody told them to go to this church up over here and they walk down to this altar and they receive Jesus as their personal savior, right Frank? And then all of a the sudden their lives begin to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We watch this transformation go on that's that's awesome. Right, Javier? Where is Javier? Is that all right, Hobbs? And wait a minute, Hobbs. Now, 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 this, now I'm going to, listen, this is so cool. Hobbs, we've been a part of watching your life, man. Part of that first time you came. And, 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 and Jesus came in. But Hobbs, then you, you, because of your transformation, stand up and tell me, because of your transformation, something else has happened recently. That's, con that, that's connected to you. Stand up and tell me what happened. What, what happened? Huh? Tell me what's going on. Huh? How good is that? Right? So I'm sure his brother, when he first saw him, thought, what happened to my brother? He's nuts. What's going on with this guy? Where'd the old hob go? And then he probably sat back and he probably watched a little bit. Like, we'll see. This ain't going to last. This is a fad. We'll see what goes on. But when the transformation is real and it's like the Energizer Bunny, it just keeps going and going and going and going. Pretty soon, those that are around you, man, it is undeniable and it impacts them for the kingdom. Witness. We overcome him by our witness. We overcome him by the evidence. And lastly, we overcome him by our reputation. Put that in. And we're going to cl close with this. Your reputation is a powerful part of your story. People see the kind of person you are. So not everybody sees the transformation that happened in the beginning. So now you show up and, and they don't have that part of your story unless you share it. But now they're looking at your reputation. How do you handle crisis? How do you handle life's challenges? How do you run your business and manage people? How do you raise your family? What kind of marriage do you have? Your reputation goes a long way to opening doors, to sharing your faith. Let me share this with you as I close. I worked for a, a warehouse back when I was in my late teens and early 20s. And, and I'll tell you something about working in a warehouse. There's a colorful cast of characters that can be in a warehouse setting. How many of you ever worked in a warehouse? Uh, you know, I mean, it is what it is. And people are who they are. And I came into that warehouse. Um, I didn't run around and preach the gospel to everybody. I didn't sit the whole group down and say, hey, let me, let me share my faith with all of you at break. Have a seat. I had just determined I was going to live my life for the Lord. I was going to live differently. I was going to show Christ through the way that I live by working hard, being there on time, and having a good attitude is the best I could have. Doesn't mean I didn't have my moments, but the best attitude I could have so that when others looked at my life, they would see something is different. Well, over time, everybody knew that I was a Christian. People would ask why I was different, what's going on with you. So then I would share, and here's what happened over time. I was there quite a while. Those individuals, even though they wouldn't come out and, and say anything in front of the group, when they were going through hard times, I would be going down the aisles with my shopping cart, pulling orders, and pretty soon, one of those guys would come up the aisle the other way and say, Hey, Mark, you got a minute? Well, what's going on, man? Hey, man, I know, you, I know you're a, a Christian. You go to church. Man, my, my marriage is falling apart. And they'd start to share with me and they'd say, Would you pray for me? 
And so many times I got to minister to individuals just, just by letting my light shine. Can I tell you, it's 34 years later and I still have relationship with some of those guys who still call me when they're going through it. I still minister to. I'm still believing some of them are going to get saved. But 34 years later, we're still talking to each other. You see, that's how powerful your testimony can be. And I'm tired of the devil robbing us of what our testimony is. Worship team, where is my worship team? They're right here. You're here. Here's what I want to do. If you're stirred this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I want to quit minimizing my testimony. I want to share. Listen, all you're doing is talking about your best friend. And I want to share what he's done in my life. You're not there to argue. You're not there to go back and forth. You're just looking for every door that opens. I'm going to share about my best friend and what he's done for me, what he's done for my marriage, what he's done for my kids, what he's done for my family, what he's done for my business. Just brag on him wherever you go. You don't need to argue. Listen, most of us aren't fully equipped to deal with, with, with some of the, like let's say you're dealing with a cult or somebody else. Those can be hard things, but we are all equipped to share our testimony and brag on Jesus and who he is in our life. That's why the devil doesn't want you to share. That's why he's telling you, you have nothing to say. You don't know enough. What do you mean you don't know enough? Your life has been transformed. You've been brought from darkness to light. What do you mean you don't know enough? You know everything you need to know. But your life is different today. And I'm sorry I get so excited. I know. I just get so fired up up here. Because I'm so excited about what Jesus has done. I'm tired of the enemy. See, the enemy knows they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. He knows he can't touch you. But there's an and, and, and the word of their testimony. If he can just get you to think, I got nothing to say. I, I grew up in church. I don't have a testimony. Mine's too bad. I don't want to share it. If he can just get you to sit on that, he knows he has taken the most powerful soul-winning tool out of your hands. I don't know about you today, but my challenge is, if you're saying, Pastor, I just want to be stirred to share what God has done for me to others that are around me, if that's in your heart, could we all, everybody stand, and we're going to sing this song. I just want to bring the lights down, and for just a moment, if you want to walk down here and say, oh yeah, God, open the doors. I want to share. I want to brag on you, Dad. I want to tell everybody about what you've done in my life. If that's in your heart today, come. Come. Come.